This program is designed to provide general information with regards to the subject matters covered. This information is given with the understanding that neither the hosts, guests, sponsors, or station are engaged in rendering any specific and personal, medical, financial, legal, counseling, professional service, or any advice. You should seek the services of competent professionals before applying or trying any suggested ideas. Good morning, truth seekers and true crime junkies. Nanette Bartow here with another episode of Hit the Road, Jack, Finding the Zodiac. Um, I have this great American flag. I found this last weekend on 4th of July. We did a family reunion up in Alturas, California. And as I passed through and into where we were going to be camping, I saw this flag hanging above the road. It was absolutely ginormous. And with the backdrop of the clouds and the beautiful sky, it was absolutely gorgeous. So I thought I would shoot a picture of that and send that out to everybody and say happy fourth. Um, I appreciate my country for the freedom of speech and uh, and, um, I would like to say transparency. We hear that word a lot, especially with politicians. However, I find that in a lot of cases, that's not exactly what we're getting. So I thought today we would start that with some remembrance of what this country is built on, which is freedom of speech and the people run the government. So Um, Last week, we were into Sherry Jo Bates, and we covered some of the facts around that case, and we kind of left off, and I'll just kind of retouch the bases of, um, we had the handwriting that was confirmed once again by authorities that the Zodiac uh, author is also the author of the Sherry Jo Bates communications. Um, At that point in time, when he took credit for Um, Sherry Joe Bates, he had indicated he had 14 kills that were claimed. I'm going to go back probably next week after we finish this on Sherry Joe Bates and count up how many deaths we have to this point to see whether or not we're consistent with his numbers. Um, Again, we also talked a little bit about the number one suspect in Sherry Joe Bates' case, which was a former boyfriend who had been cleared. Um, So moving on into additional information, I show that there was another article that says police last night asked persons known to have been in or around the library the night of October 30th to recreate the scene last night. Now, everybody showed up except for two people, and it it looks or appears as though they're making a a cry out for um, following the library reenactment. Detective Sergeant Leroy Gren said police are very interested in talking to a man and a woman said to be in the library the night the 18-year-old girl was murdered. These two individuals did not show up for the reenactment. Um, but he said that the man is described as being heavy set and wearing a beard. Gren said he was seen talking to a woman in the library annex the night of October 30th. Neither the man nor the woman were among those present last night. So they are actually looking for this individual um, because he didn't show up. And when I went back to the 1960 three to 1966 era of pictures for Jack. The one that I found was him at the U.S. Battery and Electric Company. And I know it's not the greatest of pictures, but we can kind of see here. um, This is Jack in the center standing in the front of it. He is definitely heavy set at this time. Um, Let's see, heavy set and bearded. Now we are going to see Jack with beards. We're going to see multiple pictures of Jack and how he changes from one picture to the next. Um, let's see what else they said in here was the man seen by officers in the squad car was a white male, 35 to 40. Now that is exactly Jack's age in 1969. So of course this particular, um, newspaper article is talking about the Zodiac and the police officers who witnessed a gentleman who, who shot them off 
in the direction and looking for a um, African-American male waving a gun. But um, this is kind of the description that they're giving. White male, 35 to 40, 5 foot 10, 180 to 200 pounds, and barrel chested with light colored hair, a crew cut, glasses. So everybody keep in mind glasses. Every time they give you a suspect that isn't wearing glasses, likely that that is not the suspect we're looking for. He likely would not have left the scene wearing glasses because he wouldn't have been able to see through them unless they were his and he was actually actively using them. Um, a waist length zippered jacket. Dozens of police searched the area, including the Julius Kahn playground at the edge of the Presidio. Now, the police believe that the Zodiac has an eye problem because he wore glasses even under his hood. So once again, you guys, if they're giving you a suspect without glasses, disregard that, move on, research somewhere else. Um, there also had there there are also indications that he had some connection to the military and so today 2020 i started seeing this profuse um, propaganda that was indicating that there was no connection to the military. Now, they must just think as a public, we're just completely stupid because there are far too many military connections that we have already found up to this point, and we haven't even touched the Zodiac case. It says he wore a military type crew cut or short hair. His pants had pleats at a time when that cut was not fashionable. And that's one of the things that we quoted Jack for was wearing dark pleated pants um, and shiny shoes. Also, that um, when I watched the movie Suspect Zero, which I kind of think or feel that it's fashioned a little bit after Jack, we also noted that he was wearing shiny shoes and dark pleated pants as well. So that was kind of interesting. It says that he committed several of his murders in the Vallejo area near Mare Island and one near the Presidio, and his messages showed some knowledge of cryptography, which is not something that most people knew at that time. Tashi said he leans towards the theory that the Zodiac may have been connected with the Navy at one time. Absolutely correct in Jack's case. Um, and I think that is because in addition to the fact that he wore a Navy type windbreaker jacket for the Stein killing, the detective notes three codes were used in his messages and some had nautical signs. And I was actually able to find those nautical signs. We'll talk about that down the road as some of the symbols that were used in his um, ciphers. Three, uh, let's see, one sign is used by weathermen and Navy people. So weathermen leads me right back to the um, aviation part of it and Jack's being in the Air Force because obviously the weather and knowing the weather um, and those signs are very important to aviators. So moving on. Um, Sherry Jo Bates went to RCC with Cecilia Shepard. So here's another, uh, another thing that I wasn't aware of when I first did my research into this is that, um, there is a connection there and that Cecilia Shepard was a student at, uh, Riverside Community College. So some of the things that I've poked or pulled out of this particular, uh, newspaper article was that in a nine hour meeting, the results, Monday's disclosure was that a chronicle investigation had determined a definite link between Zodiac and the 1966 Savage Knife slaying of Riverside co-ed Sherry Jo Bates. Also, the consensus of uh, several investigators attending the meeting was that Zodiac killed the 18-year-old honor student during a time in which he had some close connection to Riverside. Now, we know that Jack's brother was living in Riverside at this time, so there's that close connection. Aside from that, Jack also lived in Riverside during, I'm going to say, circa 51, 52 with Letha, so he was familiar with the area and the newspapers before they merged and combined. So he would have been aware of the um, two different types of newspapers that were running. We're going to hear about from some of Tom Voigt's stuff. Now, they also indicated that um, the poem, this, a state crime bureau handwriting expert, Sherwood Morrill, confirmed Tuesday the desk poem turned up by the Chronicle was authored by the Zodiac. So again, we have a connection not just to the letters now, but to a desktop poem that we're going to be talking about. And last but not least, well, we already covered that. Jack's brother um, has a house in Riverside at this time, and he has returned from Texas back to California looking for doors. So we know all of these facts, and we know that he was in the Riverside area in 1966. Here's some additional documents that I found from the FBI FOIA files. 
um, on Sherry Jo Bates. It states she was murdered at about 6 p.m. She checked out three books from the library at approximately 6 p.m., and those books were found in the seat of her car. Um, some try to put the murder around 9.30, but I'm going to, like I said before, take, take for granted that these documents are what we should be paying attention to because this is what law enforcement believed at the time. Um, Let's see here. It says he advised that the other points in the letter, such as the details of the manner of the murder and the call to the police department. So here again, not just in someone's statement, not just in law enforcement statement, but in this actual FBI file, it states that the murderer made a call um, to the police department and made it appear that the writer of this letter is actually the murderer. So we, we know he either has a lot of information like John Mark Carr did in the John Benet Ramsey case, which made people pay attention to him, um, or he is in fact the murderer. Um, and then it goes on to say Riverside Police Department advised that they had searched the news um, release that had been made and none of them mentioned that the middle wire of the distributor had been pulled. So this is another um, item that the murderer had um, admitted to in his in his communications, and he stated that uh, he had pulled that middle wire. So while they knew that they disabled, the public may have known that the car had been disabled. They did not know how it was disabled, and this was something that was actually written in the confession letter. So for information, Sherry Jo Bates, a 19-year-old white girl with, with a residence in Riverside, California, was murdered about 6 p.m., they're stating, on 10 66 after she had been to the library. Again, though, we have an FBI FOIA file. How come I cannot find this in the FBI archives? Where is this information and where has it gone? Um, one of the things that I found on Tom Voigt's site, again, he's the one that um, rants and raves about how he is the ultimate Zodiac um, person with knowledge, I guess, if you will. Uh, this entire slide here is actually him calling out they call him Bob Barnett, but obviously that was an alias to protect his name. And it's probably because Tom would get sued by having put this onto his website because he is once again calling out Sherry Joe's ex-boyfriend as a possible suspect. And I noted that I found this on his website in 2000, 2001. However, this man that he is claiming, or at least leading the public to believe, he leads people around by the nose and what he wants them to see rather than the truth and what is available as far as evidence is concerned, that this man was actually excluded by DNA and um, all sorts of stuff and probably a handwriting as well. All I know is that in 1998, it says... Um, and it's a very small blurb on Tom Voigt's site, which is something I wanted to point out and we're going to talk about with the Zodiac as well, is that they always make these great big huge claims with lots of information for people to go through about somebody being a suspect. And then when they're cleared, you get this tiny little three line or three second blurb in the news that, no, it's not that person. And nobody ever hears or sees that part of it. All they remember is the great big long rant that they read, like this one here on, on Tom uh, Tom Voigt's website, where it is blaming Bob Barnett, not his real name, was developed as a suspect within about two years of Sherry Joe's murder. Well, he had already left, evidently, for two de two decades. He was at, at sea, or, or I'm sorry, he was abroad somewhere else. So, of course, it had a lot of time for them to build theories and claim that he was. But once he was cleared, all of that information should have been taken down off of Tom Voigt's site. That's my perception. You don't continue to lead the public in a direction that is... Um, that is untruthful. And that's kind of the way I, I, the sense that I get out of what Tom Voigt's doing on his site is he keeps perpetrating or pushing these um, suspects at people uh, that aren't, aren't even real. So I did also find this on Tom Voigt's site that says, well, the current view of the Riverside Police Department is that Sherry Jo Bates was murdered by a suspect they have identified, again, her ex-boyfriend, but cannot yet convict due to lack of evidence. Recent information I have received suggests the possibility that Bates was an early victim of the Zodiac Killer. So, of course, he somehow has some information that he's not sharing because otherwise he would have just stated it in here. What is that information, Tom? Tell people the truth. What do you have? What have you found? What have you been told? What is your in with law enforcement or FBI or anybody else gotten you that nobody else can get? One of the things he lists is in May of 1999, one of the original Riverside investigators confirmed during our conversation that the footprints found near Sherry Joe 
Joe's body were identified as being made by wing walkers, the same type of shoe Zodiac wore almost three years later when he killed at Lake Berryessa. Um, and, FBI, and also he continues on to say an FBI document I have obtained confirms. So he says an FBI document he has obtained. Where are these files? Why can't I find them? Um, that Sherry Joe's killer did call the police after the murder. And we just showed you that document, a habit that the Zodiac was known for. And he says, note, the Riverside Police Department have never confirmed that a call was placed to them. Of course they haven't. Why would they do that? That is one of the pieces of evidence I'm pretty sure that the Riverside Police Department indicated was a similarity between the MOs of these two killers, the Zodiac and Sherry Joe Bates, that they were not able to release. Um, as a written Oh, let's see. I'm sorry. Confirm that a call was placed to them as was written in an anonymous confession sent to the police and local newspapers in late November 1966. You bet your bottom dollar if the note says it, if the communication says it, he did it. So we're going to um, we're going to place that one as a fact that the murderer of Sherry Joe Bates absolutely called the police department after he committed the murder. Now, I, here's where uh, her ex-boyfriend is clear. It says, in December of 1998, the RPD learned that Barnett was returning to the Riverside area for Christmas after living abroad for two decades. Since the newfound DNA might be the break necessary to finally close the case forever, a search warrant was obtained and Barnett was confronted upon his arrival at Ontario Airport. Skin, saliva, hair, and other samples were taken and immediately sent to the FBI's laboratory in Quantico, for Virginia, for analysis. Last year, it was learned Barnett's DNA did not match what was recovered from Cher Sherry Joe's hand. So here we have the tiny little blurb. I mean, if you look at this in comparison to the other information that I just showed you, we've got a tiny little blurb that clears him. However, I am still finding that Tom Voigt, as late as 2000, 2001, was still indicating that we should be looking at her boyfriend, which was completely wrong. Um, I do show that in Stephen Dewhurst's book, page 54, among the items found at the crime scene were a watch with a broken wristband, the side panel from a pocket knife, and reddish brown hairs clasped in Sherry Joe's dead right hand. A mitochondrial DNA profile was developed from these hairs. I believe at one point in time, there was some indication that some DNA had been completed in regards to Jack, but I don't know if it was using a family member because we know that the San Francisco PD actually botched Jack's DNA samples, mixed them or combined them with another suspect sample, and thus ending up with two profiles instead of one. And then they claimed that they could not sort that profile, those two profiles out in order to make an identification of the Zodiac. My thought here is, is any of the markers consistent with the Zodiac? If the, if the Zodiac has, you know, X, Y, and Z as markers, can you find this in those two profiles? Is there a possibility? Yes, maybe you can't say that one belongs to one or one belongs to another, but is those, is those markers there, period, at all? Because that could assist in exculping Jack or at least letting some of us walk away that believe Jack is the Zodiac killer. Um, again, I don't know that that would necessarily change my mind since there can be the probability, as we have discussed, that Jack was actually an author of the letter. So he was the go-to guy to write these letters to the media or to whomever. And then that way, the DNA and the handwriting would not match. So whoever committed the murder had left their DNA. Then Jack writes about it with the knowledge he shouldn't have unless he's inside operating with a group of people um, and providing evidence that would suggest he is the actual killer itself. Though I do tend to believe based on the evidence that we have, Jack did commit the Sherry Joe Bates murder. So moving on to some of that. Oh, I did actually get a, um, uh, a message sent to me from last week's uh, podcast in regards to Tom. It's somebody called CD. I haven't done any research on who this person might be, and they may not want to be found and not have left any information. I just wanted to pull this because this is the kind of sense that I get from Tom, and this is what this individual had to say. You are right about Tom Voigt, exclamation mark. Here is a list of his accomplishments. He's interviewed survivors of the Zodiac attacks, survivors who don't know who the Zodiac is. He's interviewed family members of those killed by the Zodiac killer, family members who don't know who the Zodiac is. He's interviewed cops who worked on the Zodiac case, cops who didn't know couldn't prove the identity of the Zodiac killer. Even the cops who worked the case couldn't all agree on one suspect. That's because they weren't the right suspect. If they had the right suspect, they'd all agree. Um, 
He's also interviewed a few of the suspects, in quotes, <laughs> suspects who were never proven and will never and never will be to be the Zodiac. He continually boasts about bringing these suspects to the attention of law enforcement. Well, zero times any other number is still zero, which after all of these years is what he has. Zero. So when you think about the statement that this individual is making, he's done nothing but bring people who are not plausible suspects. There's no evidence to support it. It is just his word and hearsay and, and other people who believe that these guys are the, are, are the Zodiac. Um, to the forefront, he has never once even considered Jack Terrence. In fact, he has such a hatred for Dennis because De Dennis was telling the truth that he literally did everything he could do to bash and put down and run ads and internet um, websites, you know, just calling Dennis out on these things rather than addressing the facts or the evidence in the case and disputing it or showing us how Jack couldn't be, which is something he couldn't possibly do because he's not a great researcher. Um, either way, the bottom line is, is that he's made money uh, and we're going to show some of those things where he accepts donations for the very information that should be free to the public, but he charges for it. And he's probably made a decent living. People have said that he's made it rich on this. I really don't know if he has or not. And I really don't care. But the bottom line is people need to stop patronizing things that are not the truth. Ha! Ah, so to the confession letter, one of the things I want to point out about this confession letter is when they received it, they could barely read it. So I'm not sure how we are in possession of something so clear and so strong, but they indicated that they had received the carbon copy of this and they had thought it might have been fourth or fifth generation carbon copy because it was so light to read. But they did note that this particular document had been done on a teletype machine, which is owned by the military at this point in time. So back to the military inclusion. Our confession letter from Sherry Jo Bates' murderer says, the confession, it's actually labeled like, it, like a poem. It's given a header, like it's a story or something. And it says by, obviously, and it's blank because he's not going to tell you what his name is. That's one of the ploys that we'll see throughout the communications. Um, he says she was young and beautiful, but now she is battered and dead. She is not the first and she will not be the last. I lay awake nights thinking about my next victim. Maybe she will be the beautiful blonde that babysits near the little store and walks down the dark alleyway each, or I'm sorry, dark alley each evening about seven. Or maybe she will be the shapely blue-eyed brownette that said no when I asked her for a date in high school. But maybe it will not be either. But I shall cut off her female parts and deposit them for the whole city to see. So don't make it too easy for me. Keep your sisters, daughters, and wives off the streets and alleys. Miss Bates was stupid. She went to the slaughter like a lamb. She did not put up a struggle. But I did. It was a ball. I first pulled the middle wire from the distributor. Then I waited for her in the library and followed her out after about two minutes. The battery must have been dead about then, by then. I offered to help. She was then very willing to talk with me. I told her that my car was down the street and that I would give her a lift home. When we were away from the library walking, I said it was about time. She asked me about time for what? I said it was about time for her to die. I grabbed her around the neck with my hand over her mouth and my other hand with a small fur a knife at her throat. She went very willingly. Her breast felt very warm and firm under my hands, but only one thing was on my mind, making her pay for the brush offs that she had given me during the years prior. She died hard. She squirmed and shook as I choked her and her lips twitched. She let out a scream once and I kicked her head to shut her up. I plunged the knife into her and it broke. I then finished the job by cutting her throat. I am not sick. I am insane, but that will not stop the game. This letter should be published for all to read it. It just might save that girl in the alley, but that's up to you. It will be on your conscience, not mine. Yes, I did make that call to you. Also, it was just a warning. Beware. I am stalking your girls now. And this was CC'd to the chief of police and the enterprise um, newspaper. So of course, this means that multiple communications went out, though I only show and I only have one envelope for it having arrived um, at the police department. So, or, or I'm sorry, Riverside press or enterprise. We'll see when we get to the envelope, which one that one went to. But this clearly means that there was more than one of these that were sent out and we've only seen one version. 
So that brings me to a little piece of evidence that we found in Jack's belongings, which is an uh, imperial knife. And this knife that was found in, if everybody remembers me talking about the green tackle box that had such things as these keys from the states where we talk about other serial murders, we found um, white cord or white um, rope that was cut in three foot sections. We have earrings that are just one of each, and it appeared to be about four of them. I have clearer, bigger pictures of these as we move through the presentation during the Santa Rosa murders, because it was thought that those possibly came from there. Um, and then, of course, this is the picture of the knife as it was removed, along with the pilot razor pens that Jack loved to use. And these boys were used, oh my gosh, like the tips of these were bent sideways and they were completely dried out, which I suspect would have happened over 20, 30 years of sitting in a storage shed. But it was really the condition of the tips that really... Um, really brought to light the anger that was being used as these pens were being used, the heavy pressure, the um, subduing of emotions and feelings that were occurring while he was using these pens because he was literally taking it out on the pens. So this being found in the tackle box and Dennis had information that suggested this was the type of knife that was used in the Sherry Joe Bates murder, though I couldn't find what type of knife because like I said, they're busily removing all of the evidence in regards to Sherry Joe Bates. They're disseminating it. They're twisting it, they're turning it, they're not even giving us the truth anymore. Um, so at my, in my search looking forward, I was really only able to find that half of the handle was left at the scene of the crime in Stephen Dewhurst's book. And I really couldn't even track where that information came from, though I know I had seen it before. And once again, like I said, I, when I researched it a couple of weeks ago, I actually found information that suggested the same and then lost it when my computer reset itself. Either way, I'm sure I can find it again. It'll just take some time. Um, so anyways, we're looking at this imperial knife that is actually missing this side of the handle, which we can see was nice and yellow. Um, and then, of course, we can see that we have a bent broken tip. So this no longer has the extension of the tip off of it. I cropped this picture down to the broken portion, but you can still see in many of these. So that's approximately how much of the tip is actually missing. It was probably about a good eighth of an inch, maybe um, not quite a quarter. I'm going to say maybe three, three, I don't know, maybe, maybe an eighth of an inch. Um, or just over an eighth of an inch that was missing. And there was also information at one point in time, which I am still struggling to find that indicated there was a tip or a piece of the blade that was lodged either into a collarbone or a chest bone, um, but that that was removed during autopsy, which would coincide with the knife breaking. So I'm not really quite sure when he indicates that I plunged the knife into her and it broke, whether it was just the handle that broke or if it was the tip of the knife itself that broke. So the tip of the the knife, if that is not true, could have been something that was broken in another type of um, murder or crime or just prying something open. Obviously, he was very heavy handed with his knives. <clears throat> so in the top here, it shows that he advised that other points in the letter, such as the details of the manner of the murder. So now we're not talking about the distributor wire being pulled and that the public wasn't aware of that, but that was something that the murderer knew and the police knew and the public didn't. We are now talking about details of the murder, not necessarily that her, her throat had been cut because that had obviously been um, very apparent and, and pretty much as far as I can tell, everybody was aware of it from the beginning that she was nearly decapitated. Um, but the manner of the murder. So the manner of the murder at this point, I believe, is going to be held in the statement, I plunged the knife into her and it broke. So we also know that there was some, there was a residence who witnessed two men with flashlights in the alleyway the night of her murder that were, appeared to be searching for something. It would be my contention that they were searching for the other half of this handle of the knife and could not find it, and that it is now in police possession. So getting a confirmation on that could rule this knife out. So again, sharing with the public might assist in either bringing these um, crimes to a close and solving and learning who the murderer was, or it could exclude um, individuals based on that information as well.
So the information that I found on this particular knife, it is a 1950 Imperial Crown Fish folding pocket knife with a scaler. Uh, obviously, we can tell by these pictures on the left-hand side that this is extremely consistent with what we are looking at. This one here is Jack's knife in this corner. And then this is a picture of it, which again, you can see it missing its tip up here. But this picture came from Stephen Dewhurst's book. Uh, I also researched at one point and found there were statements made about a tip of the blade found in either the collarbone or the chest bone and the tip of the jack's knife is broken approximately eighth of an inch or so. So um, if I remember correctly, I did, like I said, crop the picture. I probably should have left that picture uncropped and now I can't change that, but that's what we've got. Here's another knife that was found alongside that knife inside of um, Jack's tackle box. So this may be another piece of evidence that relates to some other murders. We see that this knife is also badly damaged. We can see that the end of this particular portion of the knife is completely snapped off. We can see that there is heavy damage to the top end of the blade and that the tip looks pretty much whittled down into nothing. Uh, I believe that these knives were turned over to the FBI and I have no information at this point what has been done, um, if anything, with them or if blood has even been found on them. So on to, once again, let's see. Let me get that all up here. It looks like I put this in for a live pres presentation. Um, but now we're going to actually go over the letter itself, what it contains, how it, how it um, relates to the Zodiac case. So the writing starts with a poetic reference. Um, she was young and beautiful, but now she's battered and dead. And we're going to see a lot of this poetry style writing um, in the Zodiac case. So it was no shock to actually see it in the Sherry Jo Bates murders. Now, the FBI at one point in time said to me that they had anywhere from 500 serial killers operating on an annual basis now, and that many of them chose to write law enforcement. But did they write two and three letters at the same time to newspapers as well? Did they... Um, boast about their killing and not being able to be found. I, I think about a serial killer and how they get away with, you know, 20, 30 murders over a 30, 40 year span. It's because they're not making it known. They're not letting anybody know what's going on. They're not out there bragging about it. I think that the reason for the bragging about this was to get messages around to other people, not necessarily because he just wanted to brag about killing. So, she will not be the last. That is lipstick, Zodiac, Black Dahlia. There's always a claim that there's going to be more. Now, uh, reference to having fun. He had a ball. That's Zodiac once again. And Twitched. Twitched has been recognized now by the um, documentary The Hunt for the Zodiac because the word Twitched is misspelled not uh, or here in Sherry Jo Bates' letter, but it is also misspelled twice by the Zodiac in the same way. So, and he also misspelled the word switch. So switch and twitch was obviously something where Jack didn't realize it there was a T in there um, or should have been a T in there. So he misspelled it in both of those communications. Ending with the, po the poetic reference, uh, again, is just one of the Zodiac, I call it Zodiac 101. Uh, should publish to save lives is a typical Zodiac ploy. Uh, my, my, my thought was during Zodiac and the Vietnam War and everything going on in the Bay Area with people rioting and, and uh, being against the, the war and, and staying out and doing things all at night, late nights, was their way of creating fear, instilling fear and getting people to go inside. It's a great tactic. I mean, fear is a great control. Uh, he refers to a blue-eyed brownette that describes Black Dahlia, who is from Chicago, Illinois, and we know that Jack was there when he was 17. Uh, I believe the statement was to give some busy work to the police looking at all Sherry Jo Bates high school sc uh, mates by indicating giving him a brush off. At his age, he likely was not attempting to date an 18-year-old. That was just a ploy to uh, make him look... make the police look in different directions as the Zodiac was great at doing. The next line describes what the killer did to Black Dahlia, which is cut off all her female parts and put them on public display. He did this with many of his murders, which was kind of one of the off-putting 
um, or at least another connection in the MO because many serial killers are going to hide their kills. I mean, look at John Wayne Gacy, look at um, uh, some of the other individuals, uh, Dahmer, and those individuals, they weren't laying the bodies out for people to find because that gave people a, a, a heads up to be looking for them. They were hiding these bodies. They weren't wanting them to be found. And here we have the Zodiac, the lipstick killer, the Oakland County child murderer. All of these people are in, actually laying these out in public places for people to find. Um, the warning is as if to assist the public. So there's always this ploy, especially in the, um, the accomplice letters that we're going to see where he indicates he's attempting to assist in the finding like the, um, Hoover letter or, um, in the Oakland County child murders letter where he, he's a slave or he's an acquaintance or he's a, um, participant, an unwilling participant attempting to help the police. We're going to see a lot of this in the Zodiac and further communications. So the automobile winery knowledge, Jack has a um, list of car parts that we're going to see, which means he's very um, affluent with mechanics and automobiles. And we know that he took a light, uh, a light vehicle uh, mechanics class and was working as a mechanic at one point in time during his life. And we can see the Zodiac wiring diagram again, instilling that knowledge. Uh, he waited in the library. And then, of course, we have this desktop poem that pops out in this found in December of 1966. There's another thing. When you're hopping around on the Internet researching Sherry Jo Bates, you're going to come across uh, the inconsistencies of when this desktop poem was found. I believe I have sufficient evidence to suggest it was December 1966, but you will find sites of 1966, but that is not true. Jack says in 2002, in we I read it off earlier in regards to some of his statements that he hasn't cut anyone's throat lately in response to being questioned by Dennis Kaufman as to whether or not he was the Zodiac killer. So that brings me right back to Sherry Jo Bates, where we know that she was nearly decapitated. Uh, we already talked about the two carbon copies that were mailed in two separate envelopes to the Daily Enterprise and the Homicide Detail Riverside. So that's how they were labeled and how they went out. Um, we're going to see at least um, one of those envelopes, and I'm not sure that I've seen the homicide detail Riverside, but we'll get to that. So plunge the knife um, is kind of like the statement that the Zodiac used in his Tit Willow uh, poem where he says he plunged into the billowy waves. So plunged is another connective word being used by both of these killers kind of one of those words that are a little off kilter for most people to use. So the fact that we had two serial killers making the same statement, I don't believe that's a, a coincidence whatsoever. I did also note, obviously, he talks about the game. Now, we know that one of these ciphers that were solved in the Zodiac case refers to a uh, man being the um, the most fun to to hunt and to catch and to kill and that that was a game so a game once again we have a cross connection between the words i did also note that he indicates that her breast felt firm um which would lead me to believe that we are dealing with an older individual not a classmate because if you are 18 17 18 we're all firm right it isn't until later in life and after children and other circumstances that you become not firm but clearly he was used to not firm and to feel hers and it it felt firm and good to him would indicate that he is a male that is of an older age than um college students that she might have been going to school with. <sighs> and we know about all that. So titled by confession, let's take a look at how some of these connected to. So by left intentionally blank is kind of the guess who, the Zodiac. Hi, remember me, Scorpion letters and boo, it's me, Tim Miller. Um, again, keep these these guessing games going on. He claims that he broke the knife in her. We see the, or the imperial knife in Jack's belongings, poetic references, threat there will be more. Um, and when I actually looked 
across the different communications, I found the threat of there will be more in Lipstick, Riverside, Black Dahlia Avenger, Zodiac, DC Freeway Phantom, Oakland County Child Murder, Atlanta Georgia Child Murders, I-45 Killings, Scorpion Letters. And then, of course, um, I, I told myself to check Anthrax, but too much, uh, off the top of my head, I don't believe he indicated there was going to be more, though we did see several mailings um, that extended not only to the Eastern coast, but also um, in another country. The blue-eyed brownette, many of the murders in this timeline, including the Black Dahlia, all have a similar appearance, appearance which were brunettes. Um, it refers to the game, which is Zodiac, publish the letter request. Again, he needs to get his message out to whomever it is that probably set him on the task of killing Sherry Jo Bates. The poem-like beginning, the little store. We have many victims that are taken from convenience stores or pay phones. Um, one in particular is Tim Miller's daughter in the I-45 murders. He indicates that, um, again, convenience stores or a telephone next to um, convenience stores. She's not the first, she'll not be the last. That's the Moore statement. Brownette is actually used in Tim Miller's letter. He talks again about the Brownette. Choked is spelled incorrectly. Minutes is spelled incorrectly. Um, so don't make it too easy for me. Again, spelled incorrectly. Twitched, spelled incorrectly. Um, but I shall. I shall is another one of Zodiac 101's um, use of, of wording uh, or linguistics. So he cut off her female parts and deposit them for the whole city to see. That's the Black Dahlia MO in Southern California murders and more. Uh, let's see, maybe starts the sentence. We're going to see that in the Zodiac. Might starts the sentence again. To slaughter like a lamb. That's a, that's definitely a Southern reference or somebody who grows up on a farm or is used to actually um, uh killing their own food, basically cows or, or lambs or chickens or things of that nature, which Jack was extremely familiar with. He puts I first. So um, first I equals the Zodiac unusual phrasing, I and. Um, Jack would say I and the other sergeants and the Zodiac said I and the police. So putting I, the word I first is a significant linguistic comparable um, comparability, which we'll talk about when we get to the Zodiac, because I did have the linguistics looked at by a professor from UC Davis, and he did give me some insight to the um, the anomaly of that occurring in people's language. Uh, automobile knowledge, we talked about that. Demand to publish to save lives, that's the Zodiac Killer. He waited in the library, that equals the desktop poem that they later found. Uh, the notorious reference to time that we have seen so often in the Zodiac case. Uh, the poem reference, I'm not sick, I am insane, but that will not stop the game. That really leads me to the letters we're going to see just a short year and a half from now in the Dear Draft Board letters where he's making himself appear as though he is insane and he's in a mental institution. And so that kind of ties in. Um, I'm stalking your girls now and mailed to the police and media. That's Zodiac 101 again. So found one month after the murder. So Cher Joe Bates is killed October 30th. And then at some point in December, we find, or we find, uh, it appears as though during the month of December, 1966, while removing several desks from the Riverside City College Library, one of the custodians observed a poem written on one of the desks, which reads as follows. Um, this one's a little bit harder to read, but it says, sick of living, unwilling to die, cut clean. If read, clean. Blood spurting, dripping, spilling all over her new dress. Oh, well, it was red anyway. Life draining. Oh, I'm going to have to pull this up. That's a very, very blurry version of it. I have a better version of it on the next slide. We'll continue to read. Um, either way, Zodiac wrote on five by seven inch paper approximately. I learned this from Terrence Pascal, who was one of the original document examiners with San Francisco PD and worked on the case. Or, or maybe he worked here in Sacramento on a, a combined effort. But I know that I had spoken with him and been to his home and talked to him about the condition of the letters. Jack would take that five by seven and fold the paper paper uh, or fold the paper into thirds, creating an envelope out of the paper. So there was no actual envelope in some of the cases with the Zodiac. 
Jack actually liked to take his eight and a half by 11 papers, fold them in half, and then write on them like they were a book. And that is consistent with the size of the letters that we see of the Eaton Bond paper that's sent in in the Zodiac case, and also the approximate size. If you're looking over here now, of course, whoever measured out this message did a lousy job. They didn't actually even start from top to bottom. They started beneath the headline. Um, but we can see that if we was to move that up approximately another inch, we're looking at approximately six inches writing downward and possibly another four or five inches um, to the right, at least with the header of that particular desktop poem, which would be considered uh, um, would be consistent with the way that Jack actually wrote on uh, on paper itself. So use of paper and margins are really an interpersonal characteristic. The way we actually use paper and how much of it we consume to do our writing is very, very personal and can tell a lot about the author. But we do see that this writing of this particular style of the poem, he didn't use the entire desk. He used just a portion that was approximately the same size as about a six by eight piece of paper. <clears throat> okay, so the poem says, sick of living, unwilling to die, cut, clean, if red, I clean, blood spurting, dripping, spilling, all over her new dress, oh well, it was red anyway, life draining into an uncertain death, she won't die this time, someone will find her, just wait till next time, R.H., so what we made out of this is um, it's a poetic style writing, once again, just like the Zodiac, he writes, cut, period, clean, period, if red, I clean, period, which is really similar to that of the lipstick and Black Dahlia killings in that the blood was completely drained and cleaned from the bodies. Jack has a fleshing and tanning recipe in his own handwriting where he describes that it is necessary to make sure all the blood was cleaned from the hide and how to clean it if the blood becomes stained. So this was extremely important to Jack, and we can see inside of this uh, message that it was a, a, extremely important to this killer. In the upcoming confession letter of Sherry Jo Bates' murder, the killer states that he waited inside the library for her to leave, and then, of course, this desktop poem was found in the library. Uh, I put two months here, but it was, it's more like a month, maybe a month and and a half depending on the actual date that it was found. The suspect uses a three word combination written uh, as one word, someone will. So it should, would be someone will, but it's someone will, someone will find her. Um, and we know that this is similar to Zodiac and Jack using what's his name and, and other um, considerations of words that he puts together into a single word. Just wait till next time is the same thread as lipstick killer with killing more and references there will be um, some who won't be found. And that also correlates to underground, which the Zodiac talks about and further messages. Uh, I don't know why this ended up in my notes, but I thought it I would keep it in the mix in case I figured it out. This is all really old research that I had done approximately 10 years ago. But I had in here for some reason, Einstein 41855, sweetest thy name to me doth promise much by someone named R.H. Uh, it's a Japanese haiku in from October of 28th, 1964. We do know the Japanese connection with Jack. And we also know that this desktop poem says RH at the bottom. And I'm not sure that I've figured out what RH really means, but there are a lot of things that I could actually attribute it to. One of those is a connection um, to the Japanese haiku would be right up Jack's alley. And the other is Randolph Hearst and the Riverside Herald both come to mind to me for the RH as well. <clears throat> now, the reason why I bring back this murder that we've already talked about, which is this gal who was found murdered in December of 1966 uh, in Tiburon is because we're going to see a couple letters here shortly where the author talks about Tiburon specifically. And then we note that inside this little newspaper article, it says that the woman was wearing a white raincoat and a red dress with white tennis shoes and an inexpensive witch wristwatch, deputies reported. So so that desktop poem, as he's sitting there waiting to kill Sherry Jo Bates, he's indicating that he has attempted to kill somebody and it got all over her dress. Oh, well, it was red anyways, I think is a direct tie in back to this particular Tiburon murder. And it should be considered or looked at for the consistencies with Sherry Jo Bates and the Zodiac. Looks like we've got about one to two minutes left here. Um, 
Murder tieback, side note to the desktop poem, Zodiac connected past crimes into his new crimes through communication. So the reference to the all over her new dress, oh well, it was read anyway, in this poem can likely be connected to the Tiburon murder because the Paradise Street Tiburon victim was wearing a red dress and she was believed to have been murdered around August or September of 1966, just before Sherry Jo Bates, which puts the murder... Um, or making the, the desktop poem a message of culpability for a previous crime, as we see in the Zodiac and other cases of this magnitude, coupled by, with the upcoming communications to the draft board directly speaking about Timberon is another essential clue. And um, did Jack come back mad? Did he have back surgery at Fort Miley? I'm really not showing that he did during this time frame, that it might have been a little bit later. Uh, and but of course, Fort Miley is really kind of adjacent or across the bay from Tiburon. So literally as if he is sitting in a, a um, hospital and can look out across and see Tiburon, which is where he had committed a murder. Um, but this is all before the Dear Draft Board letters where we find this information. All right. It looks like we are done, you guys. I didn't make it as far as I wanted to today. We have more evidence in this case and more communications. I will be back with you next week. Hopefully we will finish up with Sherry Jo Bates and move on to some of these ciphers that Harriet Suchet has um, solves or solves that she has come up with in regards to them and talk again with Nolan Del Campo in regards to the po politics of the time. Everybody have a great weekend and we'll see you next Friday. <laughs>